As black belts, you should learn now that your obligation is to be innovators, not imitators. You've heard me say that a lot. A lot of students come in, and students, it's acceptable in my mind as Q ranks to come in and merely come in and say, teach me, I'll be your robot, and I'll do exactly what you tell me. You know, that's what the idea of that particular rank is because you're not at the level at that rank where you can be innovative. But when you become black belt, part of your job now is to become innovative. You know, and you know what I mean. Imitators are somebody who looks, wants to look exactly like the person teaching them or the higher rank next to them. And that's okay, you know, to a certain point. Being innovative means that being very introspective in yourself, looking at what you do, how you do it, why am I doing it this way? gee, maybe if I just do this, and, and this mainly occurs, by the way, in free sparring and actual com combat, but how can I be a little different than the person next to me that makes me a little more unique and makes me an artist? And that's another point we get onto. That is black belts, in my mind, you are now becoming artists. And art for me has always been about individual expression. And again, the analogy you've heard me say, if you have five painters, all scenic artists, and you give them one tree to paint, I guarantee all five canvases will be different, even though they're scenic artists and they're painting that same tree. And that, to me, is individual expression, and that's what art is. It's individual expression. So now, as a black belt, you become artists in the way that you start to individualize and express the art that you're learning with your own little nuances and your own sort of little take on, on certain things that you've been taught. And by that, the art also starts to evolve because if you don't, if we only imitated what we were taught 20, 30 years ago, do you think the arts would be where they are today? You look at MMA, when Hoist Gracie first started in the UFC, beat everybody. That wouldn't happen today. And by the way, I'm not, that's no disrespect to Hoist, you know, he's a legend. And I'm saying that if Hoist fought the same fight today, fought the same fight today that he did when the UFC started, the results are gonna be what they are. I mean, everybody saw when he fought uh, Matt Hughes, he got schooled. Guess what happened to Matt Hughes? He got schooled by Georges St. Pierre, you know? But the evolution of MMA has come from people being innovative, from taking the basic tools and what they've been taught. Well, how can I do that a little bit better and a little bit differently from the way I've been taught and improve myself and at the same time improve the arts overall? Uh, Higan Machado, who you obviously know very well. Higan, when I last spoke to him, he's evolving. He says, oh, Richard, I've been, we're changing this, changing that. He's evolving what basically, you know, the art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has been for him most of his life. Why? Because the environment now has changed as far as what people are doing when they grapple. They've brought Greco-Roman techniques in, Judo techniques, you know, Sambo. On and on it goes. So again, his job as an artist and a representative of BJJ is to also evolve and try and keep one step ahead of the game. And again, the value of that is the arts get better. You know, they absolutely get better. Now, don't get me wrong, there were certain uh, basic notes that shouldn't change. And I don't, want to, I, I don't want to sort of give the impression that you should suddenly all come into class and you have a form that this school denotes you do, that suddenly you think you can do a different block and a different punch. That's not what I mean. The expression really comes in the way you might make up your own form if that was the case, or especially when you were to spar or move or do your own thing. That becomes a chance for you to be individual and to really stand out. Because again, if you look at what we do in, in karate in, in a school, there has to be conformity. You can imagine the military, if, if the troops were allowed to do what they felt like doing with their weapons, with their firearms, with how they conducted themselves, with how they dressed, with how they saluted or not somebody lower rank or higher rank than them. 
there's a protocol and there's a good reason for that because it's all about discipline. The discipline within your school is that you do what that school denotes is the structure and curriculum of that school. So I don't want you to lose that point. And my analogy of that is notes of music. I'm, I've said this, I think, to you guys before too. If you learn to play the piano, you will all learn the same scale. I don't care who it is, you know, do re mi fa so, down the scale. Nobody learns anything different from that. We learn our blocks. For us, it was these. Everybody does these, and they're exact. There is no deviation from the way the instructor and the head of your school says you do that. So then you start to do, you've learned a scale and you learn to read music and you learn to play a song that somebody else has written and you play that song, still imitating, correct? No? So we learn all this and then we start to do a form that has all these movements and these notes or tools that you've learned. Once again, that form should be done strictly as your style dictates it be done. That is very important. But eventually, with the piano, you've learned music, you've learned to read it, you've played somebody else's songs. I'm going to write my own piece. The notes don't change. You haven't invented a new scale. Now the order you arrange those notes becomes your particular expression of your music. Otherwise, again, obviously every song would sound the same. And your martial arts becomes that when you move and when you spar in that suddenly all these notes and somebody else's song, you start to become individual and you choreograph your own song. In other words, you move as you move, you become an individual. And again, this is important for you as black belts to understand as part of your role. To be always inquisitive, to be always, I mean, one of the things that I've always done with my training, which is very Western, by the way, the Eastern style is, if you're told to punch this way, you do it that way. Don't ask why, just do it. And do it hundreds of times. But for me, I always know, well, why? Why do I rotate? Why can't I do this? What happens if I do this? What's the difference, you know? I want somebody to be able to tell me if they're instructing me why they're telling me to do what it is they're telling me to do. I want them to have an understanding, whether it's from a kinesiology point of view, you know, musculature, everything. I want to know why to give me the confidence that if I'm going to spend years doing it that way, that it's the best possible way that this particular technique can and should be done. This is again where, I, where it gets back to being innovative and not imitate. You, you need as black folks to really be you, your teachers now. You know, you need to be innovative in the point of researching and, and finding new knowledge and being up to date with sports science and the way things are done. I mean, there's so much knowledge out there and, and I, I'm harping on about it, but this again gets away from being an imitator, just copying what somebody does because they've shown you and told you to do it that way. But if they won't tell you, you find out why it is you do something the way you, you know, that you're asked to do it. Believe me, you'll become far, far better instructors by doing this. And that's ultimately your aim, by the way. Your obligation, again, as Black Belts, is to get to the stage where your ability is of such a standard that you are able to pass this knowledge on to others. But it's a big responsibility. And, uh, you know, I, I can't employ you enough. The amount of traveling that you know I do, I'm disheartened, saddened, and quite angry at the standard that's out there to, a, I hate to say a large degree, but for me it seems to be to a large degree at some of the places that I go because of the lack of structure, the lack of discipline, and the lack of intrinsic knowledge that's within the schools, and the lack of expectation of the people that run the schools as to the standard their students should be. Because one thing you have to remember as black belts and you know this, you hear the comics, well, I'm black belt, look, I'll just strap this on. Anybody can wrap that thing around their waist, but you have to be so totally honest with yourself and ask yourself, what does that mean to me? And am I an actual ambassador? Am I a good representative of that belt? And you can lie to yourself, and tons do. The reason I say that tons do, because I look at them and I think, 
how can you not see where you're at with the belt you're wearing, the standard that you say you are, you know? Don't be one of those people, you know, be hard on yourselves. Grading, by the way, you know, should, should always, testing and everything, for me, it was always a foregone conclusion that you were that rank when you went for that belt. It should never be for me that you get up on the floor unsure of whether you're really ready for that rank and you're hoping that you're going to get through a series of techniques and suddenly that's going to be that you're ready. I mean, in your mind, mentally and physically, you should be ready so long and way before that actual time that you get up to more or less confirm and show your ability and rep yourself, represent yourself as worthy of that rank that you are hoping to attain. I mean, by the way, this is why even a lot of schools, even jiu-jitsu schools, Jean-Jacques, they won't have gradings as such. They teach you, they watch you, they watch how much you train, how often you train, who you spar with, the effort you put in, and that's really the way you are, you are graded to the rank you know, that you get. And, and again, it's, it's that journey, that consistency. I was sort of known way back for failing probably half of everybody that ever came up in front of me, whether they were 20 or 30 or 40 or 50. Uh, my partner used to sort of say, oh, gee, well, the parents, they won't like it if you fail their kids. And I said, well, you know, that's tough, you know, because I feel I have an obligation to that student to only give them the belt that they are absolutely worthy of, that they could walk out and go into any other school and walk out with their head held high when they walk in and walk out with the same feeling, not walking out going, oh, my God, you know. You have an obligation to those students, and you also, more importantly, have an obligation to the art that you represent, you know, to be worthy of that rank that you wear around your waist. That is, it's critical, it's important. It's an art form, that's why we don't call it a sport. It's an art. And uh, so there's a lot of obligations, a lot of responsibilities <coughs> that go with what you're trying to do. You know, perfection. You've heard again me say a lot, don't accept mediocrity. Mediocrity is easy. There are so many mediocre people in any level of life you want to look at. Don't be one of those. Represent a school. Be, just strive for excellence in what you do. And by the way, don't also think that means that from a physical exterior that you sort of feel that you have to be able to do a jumping, spinning heel kick and this and that and this and that. For me, it's not about that. You know, the one thing that I always graded students on and the one thing that they all had in common was their ability to try. Because everybody has different physical limitations, you know, abilities and everything. And my feeling was that if I had a student that, you know, more or less had a gymnast type physique and capabilities could come in and train once a week and attain the same physical exterior, you know, as far as what I saw, as somebody that trains six days a week, guess what, I know who I'm going to train. You know, it's that person that puts in that six days a week and just does the absolute best, you know, and tries the hardest and, and is, is, is putting their heart and soul with passion into what they're doing. So, you know, that's the other thing I want to be clear on. It's not just the aesthetics and look how physically gifted I am. There's a holistic thing that we're trying to develop in you people as black belts and as martial artists. It gets back to what we talked about right in the very beginning. You're not just martial artists when you put your gear on, you put your belt on, and you demonstrate how fast you can punch. You should show that same sort of level of expertise in, in, your, in, in your humanity when you go outside of the dojo.